Thank you for joining us on America's Roundtable, a weekly program from Washington, D.C., with leaders from business, media, think tanks, and the political arena. I'm your co-host, Joel Sami, joined by Natasha Sodorch, co-founder of the International Leaders Summit and former contributor to the Economist Intelligence Unit. We are delighted to have Mr. Rosen join us on America's Roundtable. Mr. Harris Rosen is president and CEO of Rosen Hotels and Resort, located in Orlando, Florida. In our inaugural program, we featured the unique healthcare model, which Mr. Harris Rosen applied with measurable success. And Natasha Sordorch and I had the opportunity to visit the medical facility in Orlando, which provides quality health care uh, to the Rosen Company employees. It is a model which deserves significant merit. And as we discussed, business leaders and legislators from around the country ought to give great attention to what is taking place in Orlando uh, through Mr. Rosen's leadership on the healthcare front. At America's Roundtable, we are amazed by the entrepreneurial spirit of America, which is alive and well, in spite of the tremendous challenges and barriers as discussed recently with Honorable Maurice McTeague, our guest host. America's entrepreneurs create jobs and fuel America's growth. Thank you for joining us again, Mr. Rosen. How did you become an entrepreneur? We're very interested to hearing about your story. My, my two grandfathers came from uh, Eastern Europe, one from Austria, Hungary, and the other from the Ukraine and Russia. And they came to America as so many others uh, have before them and since, because they heard about this wonderful country. And they believed uh, in the American dream, and they knew that where they were coming from didn't offer much hope for the future of their family. And so they did something, both of them did something uh, quite traumatic. Uh, they called their families together, ind indicated to them that they would be leaving uh, for America, that other family members would be taking care of them, and uh, they would be called for when uh, Grandpa was uh, settled, had a job, and would then be able to call for his family. Uh, so in the early 1900s, around 1910, uh, 11, 12, Samuel Rosenhaus from Austria and Harry Rosenowski from Russia came to the United States. They settled here on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a neighborhood uh, often referred to as Hell's Kitchen. It was not um, a very comfortable environment to live in, but um, they struggled. And within several years, both of them had um, made uh, substantial progress. Harry had a little restaurant that accommodated about eight or nine people, and that was uh, uh, he rented the space, and, and that was his little restaurant. And he sent for his wife, four children. And Samuel created a little company that manufactured wooden barrels. He was a cook. And soon, as his company expanded, he, he became more successful. He sent for his wife and four others. Both gentlemen had um, one more child. Uh, Harry had a son named Jack, and Samuel had a daughter named Lena. And both of these youngsters grew up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, met each other um, while they were in high school, fell in love, got married. And I'm told I was born rather quickly after the, the marriage. <laughs> so I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in that very same neighborhood where there were so many immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Ireland, from Italy. And my two granddads, one, one night, visited with me, and they were talking about uh, their success uh, in business. And they said that it was apparent to them that they had passed the entrepreneurial gene on to me. Well, I had no idea what they were talking about. I just heard the word gene, and that it was something special. When I went to bed that night, I must confess that mom would tuck me in at night and tuck my brother in. And when she tucked me in, she wondered why I wasn't wearing my pajamas. And I said, well, I can't ever wear my pajamas again. I can't take my jeans off because Grandpa, Grandpa Harry said I have something very special <laughs> in my jeans and I have to keep them on. I didn't realize that they had passed on to me with this gene, this defective gene, it turns out, which has driven me crazy throughout most of my life 
encourage me to take risks, encourage me to get involved with things that a normal person probably would not have. I did discover when I was around eight or nine years old that the gene was there. Um, I was at a camp. My folks had saved some money and sent me away to a camp for two weeks. And while the other guys were out playing, I was curious about a group of a gentlemen who were doing some fishing. And I overheard several conversations describing the difficulties they had in securing big, juicy worms as bait. And I asked them some questions. And they said they want these big night balls. And I said, well, if someone found them for you, would you pay for them? And they said, yes, we would pay a quarter for three big, juicy ones. That's all I had to hear. That night, I went out with a flashlight after talking to some uh, people about night crawlers and where I might find them. And lo and behold, I became an expert at catching night crawlers and selling them at three for 25 cents to my fishermen friends. And in those two weeks, I averaged about $6 a week, more money than I ever imagined any human being could ever have. And I knew at that moment that I was destined to be in business because I enjoyed my work so much. That is truly humble beginnings, yet certainly a profound start. Well, that's how we started. And, and of course, I went on to school, went to public school in, in New York City, went to a school called Music and Art, and, and believed that I would one day become a, uh, an artist or an art director in an advertising agency. But my, my dad worked at the Wall of Astoria, and as, a, as an opportunity to earn some extra money, Dad did little place cards um, at, at very fancy banquets. You would uh, go to your table and you would find your name on a card, and that's where you would sit. Well, Dad offered me a job. My job was to erase the pencil on the little place card because he did it in pencil first, then went over the pencil with a little uh, pro quill pen and Indian ink. My job was to erase the pencil, to fold the card, put it in a shoebox in alphabetical order, and then go down to the uh, ballroom with him and place the cards around the table in the appropriate order. We would bump into people on occasion who were very, very famous. I met Jackie Robinson in the elevator. I met Ty Cobb uh, on the elevator. I met General uh, MacArthur in the elevator. I met um, Paul Pope John right outside of an elevator landing. And one day, I, I remember meeting the most beautiful lady I've ever seen in my life, a blonde lady with a very tall, dignified gentleman. And I whispered to my dad, can you introduce me to this beautiful lady? And he said, sure. First, he introduced me to the gentleman, and the gentleman's name was Ambassador Kennedy, Joe Kennedy. And the, and the lady was Marilyn Monroe. It was at that moment that I decided to forget about art and concentrate on the hotel business because if you could meet someone like Marilyn Monroe in an elevator, in a hotel, that was the business for me. And so that determined my destiny. I then applied to Cornell University and accepted uh, at Cornell's hotel school. And from there into the Army, and from the Army, discharged, and then worked for Hilton, and worked for a private company in Mexico, and then got a job with uh, Disney, and here to Orlando. And Mr. Rosen, this is Natasha Serdoch. In uh, 1974, uh, you purchased your first hotel, a quality inn on International Drive in Southwest Orlando. Uh, that purchase marked the beginning of Rosen Hotels and Resorts, which now administers seven hotels, resorts, and retreats in the Orlando metropolitan area. As an entrepreneur that started small in the 70s, and have built your company living a true American dream. How would you compare the business environment then and today? Well, and, and, and so, you see, I worked for Disney and was, was expecting a beautiful uh, raise uh, from Disney because I, I thought I had done a, a wonderful job. I was in charge of the hotel division, and our occupancies were very high after we opened, and things were going well. But instead of getting a raise, uh, Disney said that I would uh, never become a Disney person, I didn't have the, the, the corporate mentality. I was more of an independent person. And so I, of course, left Disney disheartened and, uh, and uh, nervous about my future. But I decided that I would never again work for anybody else, that I worked for me. 
It was some, uh, some might remember that in the early 70s there was an oil embargo, and mm -hmm. virtually every hotel in Orlando was in serious financial difficulty. People couldn't buy gas, so they couldn't come to Orlando. And so this genius said, now's the perfect time to buy a hotel. And with $20,000 in the bank, I looked all over for the perfect hotel. I found a beautiful little motel, a 256-room motel, a quality inn, between International Drive and Interstate 4. I walked in one day, asked to see the owner. He was there. Uh, he asked me what he could do for me. I told him I was looking to buy a hotel. He then took a step forward. He hooked me so tight, so tight, that I thought he would break a rib. And he said to me, God has sent you. I was a little bit worried about that because uh, that meant to me that things weren't going very well. So I, 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 I did buy the hotel for the $20,000 I had, and that was the beginning. I do remember, I do remember working in incredibly hard, lived in the hotel in two rooms for 16 years, worked six different jobs to save money. The money that I saved working those jobs as gardener, as manager, as housekeeper, as sales manager, as food and beverage manager, as head of security, I know that that money went right to the bottom line and that was my profit in the first several years. The oil embargo was lifted shortly after I bought the hotel and I bought another hotel because people were looking at the business that I was doing and wondering how could he be so, so successful so quickly and it was a motor coach market that I discovered. I will tell you this, back in those days, back in those days, hard work, ambition, dreaming was what it was all about. Government didn't seem to be as much involved in our lives as they are today and seemed to want to be more involved uh, than they are. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful time to become an entrepreneur because if you demonstrate a desire, if, if you had a plan, if you worked hard, if, if, you, if you understood your business well and understood your customers as I did, then you had a great chance to succeed. So we went from 256 rooms to 6,500 rooms in 38 years, and I kept my word to my two granddads who said to me, as you move into business and you become an entrepreneur, which we are sure you will, you must promise us that you will never borrow money. And I kept my word. And so Rosen Hotels and Resorts today, one of the largest independently owned hotel companies in the state of Florida, does not owe one penny of debt. That's right. Uh, Mr. Rosen, uh, you make a profit and give a lot back to the community through philanthropy and also initiatives that help provide high quality services at affordable prices. In an earlier interview, uh, you described how you created your own medical facility, primarily for your employees. Uh, you also donated funding and land for a new campus of your, for your Rosen College of Hospitality Management. You have been helping children and teens in the once drug and crime riddled neighborhood. Two questions that I would have. First, how would you compare results of your private initiatives to the government funded initiatives? And secondly, how would you encourage other entrepreneurs to get more involved in philanthropy and voluntary work? You're talking about the, the results that we achieve today uh, in, in light of the government and the rules and regulations, look, it, it is becoming increasingly difficult year after year uh, to, to achieve the success that I've managed to achieve over, over the years because government has become much more um, involved uh, the, the, the life of those of those who, who are uh, dedicated to our, our little companies. The ways that one never would have imagined before uh, is, is government becoming involved. Now, Clearly, we need oversight. Clearly, we need regu regulations. But all we have to do is, is look out uh, on the horizon and, 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 and witness a uh, government incapable of uh, their, their, their disinclination to think out of the box, to be creative. Uh, the fact that they have no skin in the game, that they, they don't have anything at risk, uh, it means that they, they operate differently and have a totally different mindset. I have a lot of risk. When I built Shingle Creek, I invested over $300 million of 
my money. And so it behooved me to be there every single day, 15, 16 hours a day to make sure that the construction was going well. I negotiated every contract. The government doesn't have that interest because if they, if they, if they don't do what, what the people hope they would do, there aren't any repercussions. No, no one is going to point a finger at them and say, you, you need to fulfill your obligations and so you're fired. They know that they have a job for life, and that mindset makes it very difficult for them to exceed at what they're doing. Now, uh, other entrepreneurs, the, the young ones, have to realize that things are much more difficult now, but I still would give them this advice. Never, never stop dreaming. Never stop trying. Never give up. Because you can succeed. You can accomplish what you want. You can have your dreams fulfilled. But it's going to require a tremendous amount of hard work. It's going to require a tremendous amount of dedication. You, you, you must keep working hard and don't let the sector get you down. You can't do it. That would be my advice to uh, budding entrepreneurs. The current uh, estate tax uh, in the United States is at 35% rate on inheritances worth more than $5 million or $10 million per couple. And if nothing is done in the Congress, these rates will go back to the rates passed under Bill Clinton, that is 55% over $1 million or $2 million per couple. Uh, what are your thoughts about the estate tax? Uh, many countries that have had it in the past, had abolished it, such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, and others. Uh, wouldn't this be a good reason to move business elsewhere, uh, perhaps in one of the mentioned countries? I think what, what you suggest is, is absolutely true. Uh, my problem is that, that I love America so much that I would never think about doing that. But, but to take half of everything that I've accumulated over the years and to then uh, settle uh, my, my four children with, with that tremendous financial burden of having to pay that tax uh, would, would really be devastating and I think completely unfair. I've been blessed beyond anything that anyone could ever imagine from Hell's Kitchen and the Lower East Side to where I am today um, and, and giving back to the community because I, I think it's appropriate for those who have achieved success, they must offer a helping hand 